How's everybody? You guys all okay? That sounded unique. Bless the Lord. It's so good to be in your presence, God. We're so grateful. We're so thankful, Lord, for all that you do how you've touched our life, how you've changed us, how you've saved us and transformed us. We're so grateful, Lord. Have mercy on us tonight and meet with us, speak to us, lead us, guide us. Bring us deeper into your word, into you, O oh God. Let us hear from you tonight. Father, we bless your name. We pray for your holy anointing and your power in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank the Lord. If you want to turn in your Bibles to Genesis 3.19, I know I'd said something about the two cities, Babylon and Jerusalem. I didn't realize I had one more sermon on this series of, of about the, the manifestations of Jesus in the Old Testament. We had the word of the Lord, the angel of the Lord, the water of life. What else did we have? The tree of life. And now we're going to do the bread of life tonight. And so if you turn to Genesis 3.19, it says, In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. It's interesting that as early as the garden, bread became the, the principal food of a meal. Um, we're living at a time where it's not cool to eat bread anymore, you know, it's a little carb thing. Um, but the reality is, is in most cultures, there's a type of bread that you eat every meal. Most of us are that way. Still, we'll lie and say we don't. But, um, <laughs> but we love the bread. And it's always been like that way. It's been like that since Genesis chapter 3. And some of you are thinking, well, what's that got to do with the bread of life. It's, it's setting a precedent for us to understand that as important as food is to our day, so is the Word of God to our day. And not just the Word of God. So when I say the Word of God, we tend to think about the written Word of God. But I'm not talking about the written Word of God. Uh, I'm talking about the spoken Word of God, the Word that God speaks to you. Oftentimes you hear that as you're reading the written Word of God, and you should read the written word of God every day in order to hear the spoken word of God every day because you don't have a relationship with your Bible because the Bible is not an animate being it's not someone that you can know and love you can only love the Bible like you love ice cream or some other inanimate being but you can love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul and strength and so I'm not preaching against the Bible, I'm not teaching against the Bible, but I want you to get to understand that when the Bible talks about the Word of God, it's not talking about the Scriptures, it's talking about the spoken words of God. For, for when I, now when I write something, it's the same as if I spoke it, but there's a whole realm of, of the world and of religion, let me say it that way, that wants you to believe that God no longer speaks to you and people that hear God's voice are crazy. But God is still speaking. He never intended to replace himself with a, with a Bible, with a book. And so we make a book pretty, we put it in leather, we make it nice, make it out of nicer paper, everything about the Bible is supposed to be better. But 
And the reality is, is our relationship is not with that book, it's with the one who spoke that book. And so he's equating this from the beginning, he's telling us bread. Now, turn to Exodus 16, 4. I mean, the word bread, we use it to explain, you know, I've heard money called bread. I've heard money called dough. Um, it's part of our curse. It's because we value this thing. And it's somehow, this, you ever wonder why that it's that way? It's because it's followed through since Genesis 3 that the bread is what we're working for, that that's what we're living for. Um, and so now, the children of Israel had left Egypt, and so the entire journey of the children of Israel was a revelation of Jesus. You can see it from the I am that I am, the angel of the Lord in the bush, and it literally says the angel of the Lord, and God said I am that I am. We see that that whole journey was a revelation of Jesus. You see it in the feasts. They're all revelations of Jesus. And so this part is no different. We, we've seen it last week in the rock. Um, we also seen in 1 Corinthians 10 how that, it's a, that was a spiritual drink and the bread was a spiritual food. Exodus 16, 4 says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. This is kind of amazing because of verse 4. And we read this stuff and, and we think it's amazing. And it is. I mean, he rained bread from heaven. Isn't that kind of cool? Y'all with me? Do you not see how that's pretty uncommon? In all my life, I've never seen a rain shower of bread. Never happened to me. I'm not saying it doesn't ever happen. I've just never seen it. But God said, I will rain bread from heaven. So this bread is the one that comes from heaven. And it was a test to see if they would walk with God or not in the smallest things. He was testing them to see if they would walk with him in getting bread. And so... so Verse 15 says, So when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? Or manna. That's what they said. Manna. What is it? It's actually probably pronounced manna. What is it? And that's what it became known as. Is what is it? it may have been Cheez-Its. We don't know. For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, this is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. So literally, this manna, this what is it, this bread had came down from heaven to them. It's what he had given them. I think that's an interesting comparison to over math in Malachi where he says, um, if you try me in this. You know, in this case, he's testing them to see if they'll walk with him. And in Malachi, he's talking about tithing. He said, if you'll try me in this, I will open those windows of heaven and pour out on you blessings that cannot be contained. So he's saying he's going to try us in this, and he wants us to try him in this. I wonder if he'll pass the test. That's a question you can ask yourself. It sure is, it got weird right there, didn't it? You feel that? Feel how weird that got a little bit because it went from bread to money? Isn't that weird? How that get to, how that suddenly? I don't know about this Bible thing. Isn't it strange how we can believe that God could pour out manna from heaven in the wilderness, but this opening of windows of heaven and pouring out blessings on us? I don't know. Maybe he's wrong. Maybe he won't pass. You'll have to decide that. I'm saying it with a smile. I'm not being combative. I'm just saying it. that's really what it comes down to, is will we trust God like he's trusted us? And so this bread was unlike anything that had ever been seen. They didn't know what it was. That's why they called it, what is it? That's a good name. What is it? 
All they knew is that it was bread. They weren't sure how the bread was made. They didn't get to peek in the kitchen. They didn't know what kind of dough, what kind of yeast, what was in it. All they knew is that every day they would go out and they would pick up this substance called, what is it? Because no one had ever seen it. The name has not changed in all these years. There's no ingredient label on it. It just fell out of heaven. It's phenomenal. It was a mystery that fell daily, and they could only take what they needed daily. On the Sabbath day, they would take enough the day before for two days. And they didn't really work for this bread. They just received it. Isn't that crazy? In the Old Covenant, there was a provision for their daily needs. Isn't that amazing? It was almost like God was promising that. And so we have to, so I'm, and this is the very basic. We're going to move on from the physical bread soon, but it's very difficult to believe. It's very difficult for people to believe that God will do it in the spiritual if they can't believe he does it in the natural. Um, <laughs> I'm talking about true faith. You know, what I'm, you know what I'm talking about? True faith. I, I'm not talking about the pseudo faith that everyone can have as long as it don't cost anything. I'm talking about true faith that, that can walk with God. Um, in Nehemiah 9.50, I, wa I want you to understand that this bread came from heaven. Okay? It's important we understand this because God is setting up a knowledge about the bread. He says, You gave them bread from heaven for their hunger. And brought them water out of the rock for their thirst. And told them to go in and possess the land which you had sworn to give them. He's talking about the children of Israel. Nehemiah was. In Psalm 78, 24 it said, Had rained down manna on them to eat and given them of the bread of heaven. I, it just blows my mind that there was literal bread coming down to heaven. It's been a few years now, probably four years, when we were at the other building. Quite, it's happened here a few times, but not like there. It was almost, it was almost every service. The we would come in, and we would leave covered in gold dust, all over the chairs, all over us. You could literally one Wednesday night. I remember in particular. We were watching it just fall right in front of our faces. Some of you are saying, I don't believe it. I can't help it. And I can't help your unbelief. Um, who's seen it? Who was there and saw that? Richie saw it. Nicole saw it. I saw it. Yeah. Happened almost, almost regularly. That the goal, and we had it all over our houses, all over our cars. It was embarrassing. You go into the store, you have gold glitter all over your face. And then other people say, well, they're faking that. Why would we fake something like that? Right? I mean, that's just, I was one place, I was preaching over in Oklahoma, and I was at this conference I preached at every year. And that particular week, that gold was falling right out of heaven. And then... It was really strange because on the floor, they would just appear. You didn't see them falling. Probably would have knocked someone out. But they were like gems about that big. And they were laying around, and I, I was struggling to figure out what was going on. And then finally that night, feathers began to come up big. And they were curly feathers. I'd never seen feathers like that. And you pull them out, and they would be about that long, but they were all curled up. And so I ended the meeting because I want to be known as a feather guy because it just seemed weird to me. But these things were coming right out of heaven. And people have a hard time with that. I did too. I, I would have had a hard time with the manna. Um, I knew it was coming from God, but I didn't know how to explain it. I did read where in um, Psalm 91, it talks about him covering us with his pinions or feathers. Um, there's all kinds of ideas. I know that the gold and the gems, and I don't know why I'm off on this, was just before 
the bridegroom would come for the bride, he would send jewels ahead. And so those are signs and wonders. And there are, there are plenty of Christians that don't believe in them. Um, but they're signs and wonders. In other words, you, you know, we, we tend to think only healing is a miracle. But there are signs and wonders. And these things are signs and wonders. And so manna was kind of like that. Because God chose to bring it right out of heaven. He could have baked it right here on the earth. He could have dispatched an angel and whipped up a loaf of angel cake. All right, did it for Elijah. Could have done it for everyone. He could have, he could have, he could have made the bread any number of ways, but he chose to rain it down from heaven. Now think about that, because this is God. He has no delivery problem getting us bread. He could have made us smoothies in the wilderness. Right? Could have put a little protein in their coffee drink. He could have done anything to feed them and sustain them. But he chose to bring bread down from heaven. Um, Deuteronomy 8.3 says, So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he may, might make you know the man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. You heard that scripture quoted by Jesus when Satan tempted him to turn the stones into bread, and Jesus said, no, no, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, Another way you might say that is man shouldn't live by bread alone, but by every word that God speaks. Right? One thing that we as believers have to understand is that God is a speaking God. He's a talking God. He loves to talk. He loves to speak. He doesn't do anything in the earth without first speaking to the prophets and the apostles. That's what he does. He always speaks to his people. It's how he works. It's his chosen way. So he wanted them to be hungry and to receive bread from heaven so that they would know that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He sent it daily. If they didn't eat it that day, it was gone by the next morning. It was eaten by worms. It was rotten the next day. If they gathered too much and wanted to store it up, it would rot. If, if, if they didn't eat it, it would rot. The only time it didn't was during the Sabbath, and then they could gather for two days. So he's preaching to us through this breath is that you need daily talks. God wants to speak to you every single day. If you want to go to 1 Corinthians 10, we'll read that again. And so I'm, I'm coming to the lesson. It's not about money. Some of you are all freaked out because I did bring that up. Um, you're going to see that in the scripture, there is a tie between the word of God and the provision of God and money and bread. You'll see it you'll see that God speaking will provide for your spiritual needs and your physical needs. And that the enemy wants to get you so consumed with how you get your bread that you can't hear God speak to you. Should I say that again? Did that sink in? Or are we just that bored? You're, the enemy wants to get you so consumed with how you're going to make a living that you'll forget to live. That's what he wants. He wants to wear you out with where your money's going to come from. And you have to trust God that he has a provision in every season and every time. So, so when you look at the vastness of Israel, that you could send a, a million people walking through Kansas, and there wouldn't be enough corn in Kansas to keep them all summer. 
much less 40 years. You see what I'm saying? But they didn't go to Kansas. They went to the desert of sin. The wilderness. And there wasn't going to be any way for them to sustain their self. And so they begin to worry. They begin to fret. They begin to get concerned. And so God rained down heaven on them. To try them. To try them in what way? To see if they would get hungry for the word of God. Okay. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Okay, that's, I, I didn't just put that verse in there to be a downer for you. Um, you're going to see it later because this bread that came from heaven, as wonderful as the provision was, as wonderful as it was to eat those 40 years, the bread from heaven, they still died. Still died. So we need to understand that the bread of heaven was to teach us to the value of the daily speaking of God. How valuable is that to me? That God would speak to me daily. I think that's phenomenal. First of all, that God wants me to come to him daily. Yeah? Now, when I was in Bible college, they told us that we had to have a prayer life. That we had to pray every day. We had to read our Bible every day. And so a young man, I would say to myself, I've got to read my Bible. I've got to pray today. I have to do this. 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 And one day I was praying, and at that point I was praying three and four hours a day because I had to. And God spoke to me. And he told me I had a prayer life, but not a life of prayer. That I was religious in all my having to. And that if I knew who he was, five minutes a day would be more profitable than three or four hours a day trying to convince him who I was. I was trying to move God in my situation rather than trying to move myself into God. I promise you, if you can move yourself into God, your situation will work out one way or the other. All things work together for the good of those that love God and are called according to His purpose. But I need to hear His voice more than He needs to hear mine. It's upset. I'm not teaching against prayer by any means. I believe in praying every day. I believe in listening and speaking to God every day. Not because I have to, but because I get to. Do you know who he is? Has it ever occurred to you who it is that's listening to you? You get real humble real quick when you realize... He's the creator of everything. There's not one life living without his authorization. Not one thing is done in this earth without his authorization. Not that he sanctions sin, but he is allowed for us to be sinners if that's what we want. You realize sin is oftentimes abusing someone else. You realize the greatest sin is not what you do to yourself, but what you do to others. Right? It's not a swear word that slips out. I'm not for that. When you mash your finger, I don't think Kevin stops saying, I'm going to start all over now. But, when that same tongue begins to curse your brother and sister who is not even near you, and all the right words, 
I want you to pray for old so and so because blah 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 blah. Are you hearing me? That is a that that's that's cannibalism. <laughs> that's spiritual cannibalism. That's eating your brother and sister. And that is a greater sin, and it's abusive. Now, God didn't sanction that, but he allows you. And most of you, he'll still forgive you and let you into heaven, probably. It's not my call. I'd like to say yes, undoubtedly. That's, that's what I'm hoping for. But the reality is, is we, we tend to think that God is a machine rather than a person. And that he's spoken all he's going to speak. And we just need to study real hard and learn about him. If you can't hear what he's saying in what you're learning, you're not learning the right thing. Sure is quiet in here. See, the goal of Jesus was not to get us to have a relationship with a book. He wants us to have a relationship with him and with each other. And when you have a relationship with him, it affects your relationship with each other. The Bible says you know that you've passed, it's in 1 John, you know that you've passed from death unto life because you have a love for the brothers. So the main thing that happens when you get saved is you begin to love people. Sometimes you even like them. That's kind of my joke. I always, I always talk about that because we say, I love them, but I don't have to like them. Well, I'm not sure that's the spirit of what he was saying. Um, good luck with that. Try that with your wife. I love you, but I don't like you. <laughs> that won't work. So this bread, it's coming down, it's, a, it's representing the speaking of God, and it's daily. That's, that's the big thing, is that God wants to talk to us daily, and that's how we live spiritually, is daily hearing the Word of God. Turn to John 6. So I haven't told you anything wow yet, but kind of, is that you get to talk to God. You get to talk to the same one that talked to Moses once in a while. He wants to talk to you every day. Isn't that phenomenal? I like that verse in, verse in Hebrews, that the, that's verse, chapter 1, verse 1, starts the whole book that way. He says, in times past, God spoke to us in various ways through the prophets and scriptures. But in these last days, he is speaking to us through his son. You hear that? He used to talk through prophets and scriptures. But in these last days, he skips all that and speaks right to us through his son. It's not that he spoke to us, it's he's speaking to us. And he wants to do that every day. That's why manna was not the goal. It was the type and the foreshadowing of something better. And here's what Jesus said about it. Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. So you remember the story of the feeding of 5,000. Took a few loaves, a few fish, fed everyone. Now listen to their hard hearts here in a minute. It's, it's mind-blowing. But anyway, do not labor, verse 27, do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. That's an interesting verse, because it's almost as if that word seal, that really doesn't belong there, in the sense it's not what we're talking about. We're talking about not working for, for food, but working for everlasting food or bread of life because God has set his seal on him. I looked up the word seal and 
it means, it, the, the word is frag, fragizo, and it means to stamp. It, it's, it's, like a, it's like when they would take an official document and put their stamp on it. And so you had to break that seal to open it. That's what God had done with Jesus. It's interesting he used that term in the same verse as 27 because he is telling us that laboring for the food for our body is in direct war against how we hear him. Your needs will cry out so loud it will become hard to hear God. That's what he's teaching us. The devil's banking on it. Turn to Revelation. Verse, chapter 13, verse 16. If you really understand the ideal of a seal, we see that word used again in, um, in Ephesians 1 where it says we've been sealed with the Holy Spirit guaranteeing our inheritance until the day of redemption. It's, a, it's like 116, 117. It's between 1 1 and 1 18, something like that. I promise it's right there. It's in Ephesians 1. It may take you seven hours to read that one chapter because there's so much in it. But you're sealed, and it's the same word. You've been sealed so that your mind literally, for the devil to get in there, he has to break a seal. Now, it's interesting in Revelation 3, 13 rather, he says he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on the right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So, <laughs> you're either going to, first of all, you're either going to have to have a mark, the name, or the number. All right? Y'all okay? The word mark is another Greek word. It's not the same Greek word, but it's, um, I think it's up there. Is it in there, Nicole? Sort of. Can you fix that real quick? No? I can read it to you. It's the word charagama, Karagama, and um, it means to scratch or etching, to stamp, or a sculptured figure. It's like a it's like a graven image. Okay, it's a mark. It's a seal, and so that seal is on, on the reason it's on your head or on your hand is because it's going to affect your thinking or the way you work. Because it's all about how you're going to get your food. So people get all freaked out when they read this because they think it's coming. It's already here. Just like you have a seal on your head, you can have a mark on your hand if all you can think about is how you're going to get your food. So you're looking at me like it's a stretch. It's, it's not a stretch. It's, Jesus is literally telling us when all we're concerned about is how we're going to get our money, then it's going to sidetrack us from how we get the voice of God, the bread of life. He's not telling us not to work, because the Bible does say if you don't work, you don't eat. But he's saying is don't labor. Don't dwell on it. Don't let this world dwell. Jesus said, take no thought for tomorrow. Did he say that? This is a hard verse for us, because it flies in the face of everything we're taught. Take no thought for tomorrow, for tomorrow will have enough worry of its own. He tells us to pray this way. Our Father who's in heaven. All right? Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today, this day, what? Our what? How often is he supposed to give it to us? How often are we supposed to pray? Obviously, it's daily. He didn't say you pray, Lord, give us bread this week. It's daily bread. This is daily prayer. And he wants us to not be worried with this world. And listen, we're living in times where everyone's prophesying doom. Everyone. 
Wall Street prophesying doom. Everyone is prophesying doom except for Biden. And when he's not in office and we have a next president, they won't be prophesying doom. You, you know what I'm saying? They're going to be saying make America great again, again, again. All right? Everyone wants to prophesy. Those in office, they want to prophesy good. But the reality is everyone else is prophesying doom. They're telling us it's the end of the world. Even the Bible tells us these are the last days. And so we got the choice to become so concerned about what we're going to eat if the mark of the beast comes, if the seal of the beast comes, that we can literally be bound by the mark without even taking it. And what if it's not a physical mark any more than the seal is a physical mark? What if it's talking about a mindset or a way of life? What if the book of Revelation is allegory and there isn't a beast with seven horns and ten heads? And what if all that's symbolic? And what if this mark of the beast is symbolic? You're looking at me like I'm crazy. What if you never have to write on your hand 660 and 6? And that's what it is. It's not 666. It's 600. So you'd have a 600, a 60, and a 6. That's the mark. Some are already doing that. Islam does those symbols and those symbols in Arabic. It says all the uh, all, uh, something all of them, something about all of them. The ISIS, you know that symbol they have on their head. It's the exact same, the Arabic symbol for Allah is great or whatever they're saying on their head. Can't remember off the top of my head. But that symbol is the exact same symbols as the Greek for 660 and 6. There's not a number in the Greek of 666. It's 660 and 6, so there's three different symbols. Why is that important? Because if it's, if, it's, if it's allegorical, John's seen it. You see? Um, I'll teach that some other time. See, the message isn't about the mark of the beast. It's about the seal of God. That's upon Jesus. And if it's on Jesus, we're joint heirs with him. And he came that we could have bread. So don't worry about what you're going to eat or drink. Don't worry about what you're going to wear. It, it says that even Solomon was arrayed more than these. It tells us that the birds have nests. It tells us don't toil or spin. God is going to take care of his people. If you are one of the fortunate ones, and I'm saying that right, if we're one of the fortunate ones that get to go through the tribulation and see the return of Jesus, It's forever, man. And it is wonderful. That that generation that sees that will be the most blessed generation in the history of the world in the past, in the present, and in the future. It's mind-blowing. Well, so he tells us not to work for the bread that perishes. We read in 1 Corinthians that they ate the bread and their bodies were scattered across the wilderness, which is a little bit of a graphic way to say that. And so they, began, so they said to him, verse 28, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? All right? It's a legitimate question. What should we do? What kind of work do we do? So now what is the work of God? And so don't start shouting answers because you'll miss it unless you're reading ahead. Because we're going to say kingdom work, being about God's business, doing the will of God. Let's read it. Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. That don't sound hard at all. Except, if you don't 
do the diligence to hear the word of God, you won't believe the one he sent. Because the one he sent is actually the one speaking. And how does faith come? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing what? By the word of God. So when he speaks, he opens our ears and we hear him. He that has ears, let him hear what the Spirit's saying to the churches. Jesus said, he that has ears, let him hear. So believing is the work of God. Well, if I just had this, I could do the work of God. I just want to do the work of God full time. You can do that. You just got to believe him all the time. No, I want him to be my employer. He is. You just got to believe him all the time. Y'all okay? And so this thing isn't about being employed. That's the world. It's about hearing the word of God. And when you hear, he will make sure that you eat. It's in his plan. That's why he says pray this way. Give us this day our daily bread. I love that verse. You know, he tells me to pray for my bread before he does to ask him to forgive me for my sins. Some of you lead with that. Oh God, forgive me. I'm a sinner. I can't come to you right now. But have mercy on me. I want to pray. You come to that later. Unless Jesus didn't really know how to pray. I'm surprised he even included that in there. Because he didn't pray that way. He never had to say, Lord, forgive me my trespasses. He was telling us how we need to pray. They wanted to pray like he did, and he even added stuff for us that he didn't have to use. But it's almost an afterthought. Is the last thing he mentions is forgive and be forgiven. And yet that's the thing we think that disqualifies us from receiving from God. But it's literally one of the last things we deal with. He is concerned about your bread. He's worried about your bread. He's not worried, but he's, he's not concerned in that sense. But what I'm trying to say, he cares whether you eat or not. He's going to feed you. He's going to take care of you. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. I love these truths. I do. I hear God and I live by them. I've had to. When we went to Africa, there was no one to help us. There was, there was no one helping us. There was no, no um, major support. And everyone thought, well, you'll live cheaper in Africa. You don't. It's more expensive. Um, you know, we're just now getting to $4 a gallon. When we lived there, we were paying six. Now it's over eight in gas. I once bought um, half a gallon of milk for $13. Bought 10 Oreos for $6. Same day I bought the half gallon of milk. You know. Um, not a cheap place, but God provided. He made a way where there seems to be none. You seek first the kingdom, and he adds. Even when we built this, we didn't have the money to buy it. I remember when I was talking with Chris about buying it, we agreed on the price, and then I said, here's the thing, Chris, I don't have any money. I mean, I got a little money, but we've got to use that money to get it ready for appraisal because it won't appraise and we won't the bank won't loan it unless it appraises for enough to cover it and so I need you to loan me the money to build it <laughs> and Chris kind of, oh, I don't know <laughs> but he did it you know and we built it like it's ours trusting Chris and he was trustworthy and um, but I didn't borrow enough because I didn't want to put pressure on anyone I don't believe in that. I don't believe in holding the church by the throat and saying, you've got to pay the bills or else. Um, I believe in living within our means and God providing. 
called providing. So we prayed about how much we should borrow. We borrowed that 270000 which is pennies for what we got. So it's 14,000 square feet finished at that price. And, um, but I didn't, we didn't have chairs. We didn't have sound equipment. We didn't have fake trees. <laughs> we didn't have anything. We didn't, <laughs> we didn't have desks. We didn't have anything. And we needed this, this room, believe it or not, it's 300 set up right now. It's seat 500 easily by just setting it, you know, we got these nice first class rows where you can dance in the aisle, in the row and everything. You can pass each other. Um, but we could go to normal Christian rows and um, we could get 500 in here and we need 500 chairs. Well, that's, if you've ever bought church chairs, you realize that they're not 20 bucks each, that they get expensive, you know. You're talking at least forty to $50,000 for these, for this nice of a chair, especially these are the thick padded ones, and and Marilyn Hickey gave them to us. We just had to go out there, and I thought we were going to have to bring them back. We were trying to figure out how we're going to haul these. We we're going to rent U-hauls, and they provided the freight. We we loaded them all up in a tractor trailer with all the desks, all everything, just anything you could need for a chair. There's still stuff upstairs. We have a used yet i've donated sound equipment to church after church chairs we had 500 chairs just like these um projectors sound systems god blessed us he blessed us um because he cares because if you seek first the kingdom and its righteousness all these things are added it's not that you have to add them, he'll add them. Well, these guys didn't understand that. Um, they wanted him to show them something. They just ate like, you know, 5,000 people just ate a few loaves and a few fish and fed everyone. They needed to see more. And he says, um, what sign, they said, what will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate the manna in the desert. And as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. See, I believe that that spiritual food was Jesus. I do. I believe that it was so packed with Jesus that it gave them life while they were in the wilderness. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. And then if you skip down to John six forty eight, he says, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. And then I want to skip down to John 6, 63. It says, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. Jesus, the word of God, is the bread of life. You understand? He is the word of God. The word became flesh. So when he introduced the covenant meal to us, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, eat, this is my body. That's why we have the communion table set up. Uh, we don't do it the traditional way. Um, because it becomes really ritualistic if we're not real careful. And I've found that we have these tables set up and that way if people want to have communion, take of his body, the, 
the showbread, the bread of presence. The body, the bread represents his presence. And the blood represents his blood. The, the wine blood represents his blood. And so what it's saying is, is first you take the body, you take his presence. You cannot receive the forgiveness until you receive the bread. That's why he says, Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that have trespassed against us. Isn't that interesting? He's more concerned with us having his presence than he is how we deal with our sin. He wants us to deal with our sin. That's why he gave his blood. But he's also worried about, worried is not the right word. You understand when I say that, that God's not worried. Heard a prophecy once, a guy said, there's fear in the north, fear in the south, yea, fear in the east and the west. And the Lord says, I'm afraid too. That wasn't a real prophecy. God's not afraid. He's not worried, but he is caring about us. And his presence comes. And it bring, faith brings you into his presence, and his presence brings all the blessings. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. In other words, they will chase you down. They come from behind. So living for God is a walk of faith. That's why you try him in this. Then see if he'll open the windows of heaven, because you get out ahead, and those things come later. Know what it means? Seek first. So the first thing that happens, you seek God, and this, or seek the kingdom, and the second thing that happens is that stuff comes later. It's the same way with faith and praying for people and doing miracles. Go preach the gospel and all, to every living creature, and these signs shall follow those that believe. All right? I didn't quote all the verse. I can. It says, uh, go, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every living creature. And those that b- believe are saved, and those that do not believe shall be condemned, right? And these signs shall follow those that believe. So which comes first? Seeking, I mean, you believe, and then the signs. People have told me that if I'd seen what you've seen, I'd believe too. The problem is, is I had to believe to see what I've seen. And if you've seen what I've seen, you wouldn't believe. I know that for a fact. I've seen two dead people raised from, the, two people that have died raised from the dead in America. And in those churches, no one believed they were raised from the dead. There were nurses there that confirmed they were dead. Poor grandma was blue. I prayed for grandma in Monarch, and she came alive, and she she, she opened her eyes. She was blue. She was cold. She'd been laying there for so long. And the first words out of her mouth was, why did you do that? I was almost home. She knew she was raised from the dead. I knew she was raised from the dead. I'm pretty sure God knew it. But no one else wanted to talk about it. Why? Because we don't believe. I had one friend say, well, if you can do that, you should just go to every funeral. He's mocking me. I said, that's what you would have said when they said Jesus got up. If you would have been there. Yeah. Or let's take it away from Jesus and let's go to Paul. He raised someone from the dead. You wouldn't have believed that. And the real crazy one to me is old Philip. He was out there preaching and poof, he's gone. You wouldn't have believed that. You believe it now because you read it about 2,000 years ago. But if Richie did that, you wouldn't believe it. Unless it could be documented by some pagan doctor. Sorry, I'm getting riled up. I better quit while, while I still get a church here. The work of God, the chief work of God for us is to believe the one he sent. And if we'll do that, all the other work, we'll find grace to do it. 
But if we don't believe, what's the point? We believe it. You believe it. You just haven't been pushed hard enough. Sorry about that. I know you believe it. Let's, let's pray and let's do it. Let's just pretend for tonight that God is really hearing us. Let's just approach it that way, that God is really going to hear every word we say, that he is not somewhere out there in the cosmos waiting for a specific time to answer us. He loves us. And if we believe him, he'll answer our prayers. See, I heard it. Man, I wish I didn't hear that stuff. I heard someone think, how do you know he's going to hear us today? I just knew he heard me. He hears you. He heard you say that. Father, I love you. I'm so humbled to stand before you and before your great people. I bless your name, Lord. I lift it up because you are holy and righteous and true. Your name is great. Let it be hallowed. Let it be made holy in this world. Let people understand who you are. Holy your name. Father, let your kingdom come on this earth as it is in heaven. Even tonight, God, exactly like it is in heavenly places where the blood is still covering the altar, where the blood still rests on the mercy seat. Let it be on earth as it is in heaven. Let your kingdom come here as it is there. No sickness there. No fear there. No sorrow there. I pray in the name of Jesus that you would give us our daily bread. God, you would meet the needs of your people. Open windows and pour out blessings they can't contain. Let them try you in this. And let blessing come on them in the name of Jesus. Let the kingdom overtake them. Let grace upon grace be upon their lives. I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, that you forgive us our sins as we forgive those that have sinned against us. We trust your blood. But God, that last part, we need grace to help us. We need the gift of forgiveness to forgive. I pray, Father, as freely as you've forgiven us, we forgive others. Come on, just do that right now. Just, that's where you come in. Just believe that right now. Just like you're forgiven, you can forgive someone else. Well, I don't feel it. Just say it. I forgive them in the name of Jesus. Father, don't lead us into temptation especially in the realms of relationship. But deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. So be it in Jesus' name. Let it be in our lives. Give us a harvest, Lord. Give us souls. Give us our community, God. Give us to our community, Lord. Use us in your work. We believe you. That God, the, the, the reaper, will overtake the plowman. The reaper will overtake the sower. In the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord. Can you tell him thank you? Just use your voice. It's a, it's a magical instrument God gave you. Just tell him thank you. Just open your mouth and... Express it. Speak it right from your belly. Speak it right from your spirit. Say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. We honor you. We bless you. We glorify you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We give you praise and glory and honor. Thank you, Lord. Amen.
Amen. Praise God. We thank you, Lord. Come on, just give him thanks. Just a little bit. Just thank him. It's not hard. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for speaking to us. Speak to us. Every day, in every way, God, speak to us. Speak to us. In the name of Jesus. Can I be honest with you? There have been times in my life that people that heard God every day made me nervous. Where I thought, how do they do that? I mean, they'll, they'll come around and they, some bird spoke to them. They can hear God. Um, I quit being that way. Because if I'm going to err, it's going to be on the listening side, not the talking. Amen. Hear God. He speaks to us, not just through what he wrote, but what he says. He's a spirit and he's speaking. Now, if he talks to you and it sounds like, you know, kill the person next to you or something like that, it's not God. All right, unless they're a teenager. <laughs> Not likely. Um, but hear him. Because sometimes it's not what should I do, it's just who you do it with. You'll find yourself, he'll speak to you. People, God speaks to people in all kinds of ways. He never stops speaking. And when someone that you think doesn't even know him comes to you and says, God spoke to me and he told me this, this, and this, don't discount that just because you don't think they're where you are. God, it's a journey. And they may be at the very beginning journey. And God speaks to that person differently than he does to, say, Moses. Do you understand? It's, we're not the barometer for someone else's relationship. We're not the one that decides what someone is hearing and not. Um, now, prophetic words is another story. They have to be judged. But when God speaks to someone personally, you know, that's what he does. He's an expert at that. He's an expert at that. I'll explain the prophetic words some other time. Um, but... The, the, I'm talking about God speaking to your inner man. That brings you life every day. You need to hear it every day. Every day. You don't grow up and then someday you hear the word of the Lord. He speaks. It, that's how he reveals himself. It's through his word. All right. Okay, we have a meeting in here for the VBS meeting. Immediately following. Should have started about 10 minutes ago. So sorry about that. Um, Nicole will do it.